I got it. You're something. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, did y'all get that on tape? I'm going to take that back to my church. They need to hear that introduction. Actually, I went to the high school where Friday Night Lights came from. Odessa Permian, Odessa, Texas. I was telling your pastors earlier tonight that uh, there's approximately 1,000 working oil and gas rigs in America. 45% of them are in the region where I live right now. So pray for us. The more you pray for us, the more money you get from us. Praise God. There you go. That's the way it works. It's like, there you go. There you go. <laughs> How about your praise and worship ministry? Can somebody say something about that tonight? You, you, you know what I love about them more than anything else? The number one thing in life I love is passion. And boy, do y'all have passion. Y'all, that's West Texas. Y'all have passion. And by the way, there's only two kinds of people in the world. You know what they are, don't you? Those who live in Texas and those who want to live in Texas. <laughs> Just, just so you know, just so you know. You, know uh, 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 you took some of my thunder, some of the things that Willie and Jensen were saying, but I love this ministry. There's just something about it that has endeared my heart to you, to your pastors, to your staff. I love coming here. I love being a part of this. Our church prays for you every single Sunday. We put your pictures up and pray for you. We believe in you. We believe in the vision. We believe in the ministry of Dream Center. And uh, we're very, very honored every single year to come and bring a check to you. And so our goal one day is going to be a million dollars, but I'm not there yet. But in the meantime, here's a check for $50,000. <laughs> Love you, man. Love you. It's awesome. God's good, isn't he? We, we started our ministry in the end of 1981, and the Lord put it in my heart, 10% of our tithes we put aside, and, uh, and we use that for things like this, to give to missions. Uh, we've paid for ministers, for missions conferences all over the world, because that's just what our heart is. The Lord put it on our heart to be a giving church, to bless other ministries, to believe in the five-fold ministers, and to bless you. And so, thank God we're all in this together. Amen. We really are. Well, I just want to remind you tonight that God loves you. He is for you. My favorite verse is John 10.10. 10. The last part of the verse, Jesus said, I've come to give you life. And I've come to give it to you more abundantly. So I want you to know, Jesus wants you to have an abundant life in every aspect of your life. Your spiritual life, your mental life, your physical life, your health, your financial life, your relationships, your social life. Jesus wants you to enjoy life. The Bible says to us in 1 Timothy 6 that God has given us all things to enjoy. And so life is to be enjoyed, and again, that's why I love the Dream Center so much, because they take, quote, seemingly what the world would say are nobodies and makes them into a somebody. Would you give your pastors a great big praise God tonight? Amen. I'm going to talk to you a little bit tonight about salvation, maybe a little direction, a different direction than maybe you've ever heard before, but in doing so, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my journey and just intersperse it with the Word of God. Let me just share some scriptures as we begin. In Romans 10, 13, the Apostle Paul writes, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. And then same writer, Paul, Romans 1, 16, he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now, this word salvation in the original text is the word soteria. Everybody say soteria. soteria. That's the word salvation 
And let me share with you from the Greek concordance what this word means. Number one, it means deliverance from sin and its spiritual consequences involving an attachment to the body of Christ and admission to eternal life with blessedness in the kingdom of Christ. Number two, this word soteria, salvation, means preservation from danger or destruction. And then thirdly, this word salvation, soteria, listen now, it means prosperity. It means health. It means victory. It means welfare. It means safety. And then let me read some other verses, and then I'll share some thoughts with you tonight. In Luke 3, 16, John the Baptist answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Acts 1, verses 4 and 5. Right before Jesus ascended, he made this statement. And being assembled together with them, he, Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Verse 5. For John, John the Baptist, truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then Acts 1.8, Jesus also said this, but you shall receive power. Would you say power? power. That word power, you all know, is the Greek word dynamis, which means the miracle working power of God. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses. Everybody say, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I am a witness every day of the gospel of God's love. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And then lastly, chapter 2, verse 4, on the day of Pentecost, when the 120 believers were in the upper room praying, waiting on God, the Holy Spirit came rushing in like a mighty wind, and he sat on the heads of all 120 of these believers with shafts or cloven tongues, shafts of fire, and verse 4 says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Back in the 70s, I was living out here, working in the outdoor advertising uh, uh, industry, and I had been with my girlfriend for a number of years, and we had broken up for two years. We got back together Christmas of 1973, and then she moved out here, and she was a school teacher. She worked for the Buckley School down in San Fernando Valley. I was in the outdoor advertising business. I worked, first of all, in La Mirada, then Linwood. And I loved it out here. I just love Southern California. And so we decided to be married. And so we were going back to our hometown of Odessa Christmas of 1974 to be married. And so we were on Continental Airlines Friday evening at 6 o'clock uh, time to leave uh, L.A. And as you well know, sometimes fog comes into LAX. And so they took us out on the tarmac for six hours. From 6 to 12, we were on the tarmac. We never got off. But when we were plane, uh, boarding the plane, we went probably to the 8th, ninth, 10th row, and there was a young woman, a teenager, who came, and they set her down, and she had cerebral palsy. She was by herself at the time. And just a few minutes later, a woman came in, looked at her and sat down with her and began to minister to her, began to attend to her needs. My wife, my fiance at that time, and I thought that she was probably her guardian, her nurse, uh, her mother. We didn't know because they act, she acted like she knew her. Well, again, at 12 o'clock, they took us back to the terminal, told us to come back the next morning. So we came back the next morning. We were sitting in the lobby waiting to uh, board the plane and this woman who took care of this young girl came and sat down next to us, started talking to us. Now, I was raised in church. 
As a matter of fact, I went to church on my own as a teenager. Nobody made me go to church. I was a Methodist. Everybody say, God bless the Methodists. I went to church every Sunday, went to Sunday school, and, uh, but I wasn't a Christian. Nobody ever told me about the new birth. Nobody ever told me about being born again. Didn't, I knew nothing about that. And so she sat down next to us. Her name was Joan Mallory. And Joan began to talk to us and tell us as we began to ask her questions as to who she was and what she did and, and why she came and sat down next to this young girl because we asked, where is she? Because we thought again that she was her guardian mother, nurse, something of that nature. And she said, no. She said, as a matter of fact, I work at a school for a church in Anaheim by the name of Melody Land Christian Center. Back in the 70s, that was a very big time charismatic church in America. Ralph Wilkerson was the, uh, the pastor, a big time church. I knew nothing about that at the time. And so she said, uh, I'm a special education teacher. And she said, when I came in and I saw her on that front row and no one attending to her, my gifts kicked in. I just began to minister to her and take care of her. Well, I was 25 years old, and I, that impressed me. Yeah. It's always impressed me to see people reaching out and helping other people. Right. And that really impressed me. Yeah. And yeah. she began to talk to me and my fiancé about the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody had ever talked to me about Jesus this way. Nobody had ever uh, shown an interest in me telling me about the love of God, about the new birth, about Jesus, about his going to the cross, shedding his blood. I'd really never heard all of that in just one 10 or 15 minute uh, time with someone. Well, they called us, and so we got on the plane, and uh, she, we, the plane stopped in El Paso. She got off because she was going to her mother's house in New Mexico. And so when she got off, she handed me something. She handed me a letter. And she handed me this little trifold, just a little trifold. You pick it up, you, you open it up, and it had little cards in it. And I didn't pay any attention to it. I just put it in my pocket, and she wrote a very lovely letter about my uh, impending marriage. And so didn't think about anything about it afterwards. So we get to Odessa on Saturday, and on Monday I get sick. I get tonsillitis. And so I'm in bed all week before my wedding, and then I get well enough, we get married on the 28th of December, and so the next day, we fly off to Mazatlan, Mexico for our honeymoon. Now remember, I'm not a Christian. I've just heard about Jesus. Raised a Methodist, but nobody ever told me about the new birth. And so we get to Mazatlan about 2 or 3 in the morning, go to bed, get up at noon, we would go out to the pool, and you can tell I'm a very, 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 very white Caucasian. <laughs> Caucasian. I'm a very white young man. And so I go out and I get sunburned. And so I come in about 6 o'clock and I'm now I've got sunburn. I have a relapse of the tonsillitis, which is inclusive of fever. So you have the sunburn, you have fever, and plus, like a dodo, I drank the water in Mexico. <laughs> not smart. Not smart. So now I've got diarrhea, okay? <laughs> Up to this point in my life, it's the sickest I've ever been in my life. I've never been that sick. So that was Monday. So the only way I could get any kind of relief, my wife would draw me cold baths and I would go get in the cold bath and just get a little relief from the sunburn and from the fever I'd get back and go in bed it all come right back to me well Monday passes Tuesday passes nothing gets better we can't get a doctor and so Wednesday well Paulette my wife her name is Paulette and her mother they were Church of Christ they grew up Church of Christ everybody say God bless the Church of Christ and so, but her mother was seeking something more in life. And she was just getting hold of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. 
She was coming into charismatic circles and she was learning about the baptism with the Holy Spirit, speaking with tongues, speaking with other languages. And uh, in my estimation, she was a fanatic. I thought she was nuts. <laughs> when we were home getting married and, and she started talking, Jesus, Jesus, she, I thought she was off her rocker. I thought she was crazy. Say, I, I, Methodists, we're respectable. And so she started praying for us, obviously. And so on Wednesday, the 1st of January, 1975, I'm miserable. I'm on my honeymoon. I'm miserable. And Paulette said, you know, Mom says that if you will just praise the Lord Jesus, he will heal you. I'm a Methodist. For Methodist, healing has passed away. And so I'd never been taught that. Now, when you're desperate, you'll do desperate things, no matter what you've ever heard in your life. And so she said that to me, and I thought about it for a few minutes. I said, I can just start praising Jesus, and he will heal me. She said, yeah, that's what Mother says. And so I heard a voice inside me. And the voice said, go to your shaving kit. I thought, what? How weird is that? I'm laying in bed. It's about three in the afternoon. And my shaving kit is in the bathroom. And I have a voice that say, go open up your shaving kit. What's that about? Well, I do it. And when I do, there's that little trifold. How it got in there, I have no idea. But there's that little trifold that Joan Mallory gave me when she got off the plane in El Paso. And so I opened it up, and there's three sets of cards. In the middle, I went right to the middle, I picked up the card, pulled the card out, and on the front of it, it said, is it God's will to heal you? Man, this boy is hoping against hope. It says yes on the back side. And so I turn it over. And it gives, I think, 1 Peter 2.24, maybe Isaiah 53.5, and it says, yes, by all means, Jesus has paid the price for your healing. I'm convinced. And so I'm laying on my back, and I just start saying, Jesus, I praise you. Jesus, I praise you. It's kind of like eating cornflakes without the milk, dry as it could be. <laughs> Jesus, I praise you. Jesus, I praise you. Jesus, I pray. I don't know how long I did that. I have no See, I'm calling on his name. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm calling upon his name. This is what happens. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it was two minutes, five minutes. I don't know how long. Something hit my foot, my right foot. Now, you've all had your foot or your hand go to sleep. That's what it felt like, but there was no pain in it. And all of a sudden, whatever hit my foot, I described it at that juncture as an entity. That's all I knew, an entity. That's all I could say. Hit my right foot and started traveling up my body. Wow. Slowly, but traveling and engulfing my body from my feet, through my legs, my torso. And now, I'm a Marlboro man. And back in the 70s, the Marlboro man was the cowboy, the rough-looking cowboy. I'm a Marlboro man. Marlboro man, don't cry. I started crying like I hadn't cried in years. I couldn't help myself because something was invading my body. Something was doing something in my body, and I didn't understand it. And I was crying. Even though I was freaked out, it was warmth. It was comforting. It was something I'd never experienced in my life. And it got up to the top of my head. And when he did, something lifted off my shoulders. It's the sin nature. Wow. I didn't understand it then. Wow. But, I mean, I literally felt something leave me. It was the sin nature living my, leaving my life. Wow. And it was like, he did a, I can't explain it. I know this is hard to fathom, but it's like he did a U-turn. He U-turned and started going right back down the way he wow. came in. And after it was over, of course, my wife's looking at me, what has happened to you? <laughs> and I'm laying there, and I stopped crying. Wow. 
and I experience a peace I had never experienced in my entire life. Never. Wow. Never, 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 never. Now, I didn't know I was saved, but I was saved. But I was healed perfectly. The pain from the sunburn, the tonsillitis, the fever, the teristas, the diarrhea, all gone. Well, well, so, I go have me a honeymoon now. Praise the Lord. So we come back to L.A., and, and Paulette's mom starts running references and talking to people because this is kind of a side note, but when I got out of college, my first job was just in Chicago. I was there about a year, didn't like it, left, came back down to Texas, to Dallas, where all my friends were. I interviewed a lot of different companies. Nothing jailed with me. And uh, I went to bed one night, and again, I'm not a Christian. I'm a Methodist, not a Christian. <laughs> and I lay down, and I'm frustrated. And I say to the Lord, I say, God, I don't call him Lord, I call him God. God, listen, I'm frustrated. And I said, I know you have something for me. I know you do. And I said, I'll make a deal with you. See, I thought you made deals with God. I thought you negotiated with God. I said, I'll tell you what. If you will find me the job that I know I'm suited for because I know that you know what it is, I'll start tithing to you. Where I got tithing, I have no idea. And so... I'm not going to go through the, all the, the steps that took place, but within just two weeks, I was interviewing out here in Southern California. I'm young, I'm single, I'm good looking. Come on now. Don't laugh at that. And so they offer me a job. It's some people I know. It's a publicly traded company. And so I go to work out here, and uh, I honor my commitment to God. I'm living in West L.A., and there's a, a Methodist church near there called Westwood Methodist Church. I joined in February of 75 and started tithing immediately. Do you know from that point until today, I have never been without financially. I'm debt free right now because I've learned the value of giving to God. Well, but it was not the church for me now. And so my mother-in-law said, you need to go down to Van Nuys to a church called Church on the Way, and the pastor is Jack Hayford. So we go down there, and we start going to church, and I, my mind is blown. I've never seen a church. I've never seen a pastor like him. I've never seen a church like I've never seen worship like this in all my life. And so we get indoctrinated, and we go every Sunday. And then a year and a half later, we're transferred up to Northern California to Stockton. And so because we're in the Foursquare Church here, we go up there to the Foursquare Church, and we get involved. We get water baptized. We've never been water baptized. This is April 17, 1977. We get water baptized, and then we all go out with the pastor and our life group leader, to a restaurant afterwards and uh, and we walk out and the life group leader says hey the pastor told me that you're interested in the baptism with the holy spirit now it scared me a little bit in those beginning years but now my wife and i were ready so he gave me a, just a little book by his uncle his uncle had written this little book so my wife and i went home i read the book and i did exactly what it told me to do the same experience I had in Mazalan, Mexico, hit my right foot. The, ex the exact same experience all over again. Up, down, and now I'm speaking in the Spirit. My wife hears me. She gets jealous. She grabs the book from me, goes into the den, and all of a sudden I hear her singing in her spiritual language. I go in there and join her for the next hour. We sing and worship. Our life changed. Our life changed. Now, the next morning, I woke up at 6 a.m. And I'm, I'm, I'm there right now. I get out of the bed, and my feet hit the ground. And the Spirit of God spoke to me. He said, your life will never be the same now. 
your life will never be the same. Through the new birth, I've now been baptized in water, and now I'm baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so now, my life starts changing. I won't go through all the different events. Here's what I want to share with you tonight, which I believe is going to help you. First and foremost, when you call upon the name of the Lord, He's there with salvation. He's there with deliverance. He's there with peace and joy and prosperity and health and welfare and victory. He's there every moment of every day in your life. But now that I'm baptized with the Holy Spirit, immediately, no one teaches me. I just start praying in tongues. It's fascinating to me. I'm fascinated by it. It makes me feel good every time I pray in the Spirit. And so I learn from Scripture some of the benefits that God gives born-again, Spirit-filled, Spirit-led believers when they learn to release their prayer language, not just when they come to church, but every single day on purpose. The Bible says to us, on that inaugural day when they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, it was on Pentecost Day, Acts chapter 2, I read verse 4 a while ago, the Bible says that for Pentecost, all the surrounding people came in from the surrounding cities. They came in to have the Feast of Pentecost. And so the 120 believers who were now baptized with the Spirit, they came from the upper room, they came downstairs. It was 9 a.m. in the morning, and they were walking around like drunken men because they were so inebriated on the Spirit of God. And everybody thought they were drunk. And then they begin to say, no, this is not what took place. But verse 11 says, what took place, the, all these people hearing them speak with tongues, Acts 2.11, the Bible says, they heard them magnifying and praising God for his works. They heard them speaking out, boasting in the wonderful works of God. So every time you're praying in the Spirit, you're praying the wonderful works of God. You're boasting of the wonderful works of God. You go to Acts chapter 10 and verse 46. The Bible says that when you pray in the Spirit, that you are perfectly magnifying God. You are perfectly exalting God. It's the most perfect form of worship there is. Perfectly magnifying and praising Almighty God. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 17 says that when you pray in the Spirit, you give thanks well. You give thanks well unto the Most High God. There are benefits, church. Why would God on the inaugural day when the church was formed, the first gift He gave was the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Why would He give that gift to the church for the church not to use it? For the church not to take advantage of it. God wants us to take advantage of all his gifts. God wants us to take advantage of everything he's given us. For his glory and for our benefit. For the benefit of the church of Jesus Christ. And I love what Paul said to us in Romans chapter 8 verses 26 and 27. He said when you pray in the spirit you're praying the perfect will of God. You're praying the perfect will of God. And so, you know, I, I, uh, all of us ministers have detractors. All of us have critics. Yes. And, you know, sometimes they want to pray those psychic prayers like, oh, I bind up Pastor Matthew. That's just a psychic prayer. You know, <laughs> that's all that is. Yeah. He's rubber, they're glue. Everything they pray bounces off him and sticks on them. <laughs> the way it is no 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 I tell people listen when you pray for me pray for me in the spirit you can pray Paul's prayers in Ephesians 1 3 Philippians 1 Colossians 1 but pray for me in the spirit why because you're praying the perfect will of God every time if you have loved ones who are not saved one of the best ways you can pray for them after you pray that God sends labors the harvest by their paths that you can pray for them in the spirit that's what my mother-in-law was doing all those years she was praying for us in the spirit believing God for us to be born again believing God for us to be baptized with the spirit believing God to get it in the right church believing God to be who God called us to be 
When you need to pray the perfect will of God, when you pray in the Spirit, pray that God is leading you in a direction that is perfect for your life, the perfect will of God. It's the perfect will of God for your life. And then the Bible says to us, you're going to love this one. In Isaiah chapter 28, verses 11 and 12, the Bible says, For with stammering lips and another tongue, God will speak to us. To whom he said, this is the rest. Everybody say the rest. Yes. With which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. You ever get tired? You ever get weary? All of us do from time to time. Do you know that there's another time, the initial time, that God talks about someone becoming weary? Something, someone becoming tired? You know who it was? It was Esau. It was Esau. And remember what Esau did? He came in from hunting one day, and his brother Jacob tricked him into giving up his inheritance. He tempted him with a bowl of stew. Esau, he was famished. He was so hungry. And he was willing to give up his inheritance for one bowl of soup. And the Bible says to us in Genesis chapter 25, 29, and Esau came in from the, wheel, from the field and he was weary. It's the exact same Hebrew word for the word I just gave you a while ago from Isaiah 28 and verse 12 that says that you may cause the weary to rest. You know what people do when they're weary? They do dumb things. <laughs> right, right, right. I can, and I've told my church many times, I'm at my worst when I'm tired. Yes, Lord. When I'm burning the candle of both ends, I'm at my worst. And so I've trained myself when I'm, when I'm weary, when I'm tired, pray in the Spirit. Pray because God says, this is the rest and the refreshing that I will give you when you pray in the Spirit. It's fabulous. It's one of the finest gifts God has given mankind. And then the Bible says to us in Jude, verse 20, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, pray in the spirit do you know that when you pray in the spirit you are stimulating your faith you're building up yourself on your most holy faith and then the very next verse verse 21 says and keep in the love of God do you ever come across people that you don't feel like loving <laughs> the Lord tells us that one of the major ways that you will stay in the love of God, especially towards the unlovely, towards someone that just rubs you the wrong way, one of the major ways, he says, when you pray in the Spirit, it helps you keep in the love of God. You stimulate your faith when you pray in the Spirit. You're praying the perfect will of God. It will give you a rest. It will give you a refreshing. It will change your life. Now, let me get to my two favorite ones. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2. Paul said to us that when you and I pray in the Spirit, we pray mysteries. Everybody say mysteries. Oral Roberts, how many of you know who Oral Roberts was? He built Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. A minister friend of mine one day was up in the high tower with Oral Roberts and Earl said to him, he said, I want you to look around. I want you to look around this whole campus. He said, every building that we built was built by praying in the Spirit. Because before he prayed in the Spirit for what God wanted him to do, it was a mystery. How many of you are single right now? How many one day, if you're single, you would like to be married one day? And by the way, being single is a gift. We celebrate your being single. We don't say you have to be married. But if you're single, that's great. But if you'd like to be married, most of you probably right now don't know who that partner will be one day. What is it? It's a mystery. 
how many of you know what you're destined for in terms of a career, a ministry? How many of you already know what you're destined for? Let me see your hands. About 10% of you. Why? Because it's a mystery. See, I knew, again, when I was a younger guy, especially in my teens, I knew I was destined for something. Even one who was not a child of God, I knew I was destined for something. I just didn't know what. I told all my friends, I don't know what I'm destined for, but whatever I'm destined for, when I figure it out, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it with all my might. Yeah. And God is going to bless me. Amen. I wasn't even a Christian back in those days. It was a mystery to me. And it took me several years for God to lead me once I started yielding to Him. And once I started praying in the Spirit, I can tell you right now, mystery after mystery after mystery has been unfurled into my life. Had I known, possibly in those early years when I stepped out of bed after being baptized with the Spirit and my feet hit the ground and I heard a voice that said, your life will never be the same. Had I known him, the Lord just spoke to me three or four years ago. He said, in those early years, the majority of what you were praying in the spirit, which was unknown to your mind, you were praying about your future ministry. Yeah. You were yeah. praying about yeah. the church I had you pioneer. Yeah. Now, had I known that, I would have quit praying in the spirit. I didn't want to be in the ministry. I didn't want to be a pastor. I wanted to own my own business, to be an entrepreneur. That's what I wanted in life. But God had other designs on my life. And so I was praying all these mysteries. And so I've learned, I've learned about praying these mysteries. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 13, when you pray in the Spirit, ask God for the interpretation. Ask Him for the interpretation. Now, I told you earlier on my honeymoon, before I got married, I had tonsillitis, the relapse of it on my honeymoon. From the time I've been a child, I've had throat problems, allergy problems, sinus problems. It's been the only major thing that has dogged me for the majority of my life. And here three or four years ago, it was late fall, early winter, I was having a major problem with sinusitis, sinusitis. I was losing my voice, the drainage into my voice. A preacher doesn't need to lose his voice. I was losing my voice, and so I would get well for a few days, and then I'd go right back to it. And this would go on and on and on every year, six, seven times a year, two weeks at a time. And so I didn't know the answer. So I started learning what the Scripture says about praying in the Spirit. You're praying mysteries. And by the way, let me remind you tonight, the Bible says God is a faith God. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Yeah. So when I pray in the Spirit, I just, by faith, tell the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Lord, I'm going to pray about this situation right now. I'm going to pray to the extent that I know from Scripture in my known language, but that's going to run out very quickly. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray in the Spirit your perfect will, Romans 8, 26 and 27. I'm going to pray the will of God, and Lord, three or four years ago, it was December, I was having all these problems I had all my life, and I said, Holy Spirit, I'm going to pray this in the Spirit. It's a mystery to me, and I'm going to ask you for the interpretation. That was on a Friday morning, a Friday morning. Now, the way the Holy Spirit deals with me many times for the interpretation, I just get a knowing. I just start knowing something. Sometimes my wife will say something to me, and I know it's God speaking to me. Uh, back in those earlier days, uh, my mother-in-law, God forbid, will say something to me, and I knew it was God speaking to me. Come on, somebody. It was amazing. But normally, the number one way the interpretation comes, I just know something. All of a sudden, I just know it. I just know it. Monday after that Friday, I was in my office, and I was walking into, my wife and I have a bathroom between our offices, I was walking into the restroom, and I heard a voice inside me that said, you're eating too much honey. Well, 
I prepare breakfast for my wife and I five days a week, and uh, whatever she wants, I make it. I'll normally eat what she likes. And so we were eating. I am a good husband. I really am. And I love to do it, by the way. I love to serve my wife. There's no, I can't think of anything. Oh, what's the matter with y'all over here? And so she'll get on a different kick. One week she'll want this, next week that. And so she wanted oatmeal for a couple of weeks. And so we like to put honey on our oatmeal. That's what the mystery was. I'm a sugar holic. Yes. When I grew up as a kid, my mom made a dessert every day of my life. <laughs> we had ice cream every day in our freezer. We had candy in our drawer every day. We had Cokes in our refrigerator every day. I grew up loving sweets. And when the Lord spoke that to my heart, that mystery unveiled, I went back through my whole entire life and realized everything I've been through, sinusitis-wise, allergy-wise, sore throat-wise, it was all because of too much sugar. I gave up the honey. Within two days, I was totally healed. That has been, it's either three or four years ago that took place. I still eat sugar, but I've cut back about 90%. In the three or four years, remember, I'm telling you, every year I had a problem six, seven times a year. For two weeks at a time, I've not had one problem. Not one problem. What did I do? I just did what the Bible told me to do. I prayed a mystery. And I asked God, reveal this mystery to me. Reveal this wisdom to me. And he did, and it's worked. And then lastly, the last one, same chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, 4. The Bible says that when you pray in the Spirit, you build yourself up. And remember, Jude 20, you build yourself up on your most holy faith. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says when you pray in the Spirit, you build yourself up. That word build is a very interesting word in the original text. It's the word oiko domeo. Oiko domeo. You can look it up in Strong's Concordance. It means to build the temple, to rebuild the temple, to repair the temple. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so... Over the last several years, I've had several things attack my body. Back in 2016, I got out of bed one morning, and I could barely walk. And I found out later on what it was. It was called plantar fasciitis. It affects the ligaments and the cartilages in your foot, and you can hardly walk. It's, it's excruciating to walk. And so I started praying in the Spirit. I started attacking it. Faith attacks. And so I started attacking it. I started saying, Lord, I'm praying in the Spirit, believing that this plantar fasciitis has been cursed. You've already healed it by faith. I need the manifestation. And so, Holy Spirit, as I pray in the Spirit, I believe you're going to repair my foot. 2016, I woke up, got out of bed one morning, totally healed. Totally healed. Spring of last year, 2017, all of a sudden something went wrong in my back. And it wasn't just a strain where I work out. It wasn't just a strain. It was a major deal, and I knew it. You know how you just know something? I had a major problem in my back. Oh, I didn't want to go. I couldn't drive. In fact, I was supposed to do a Pastor Neiman's uh, West Campus dedication. I couldn't go because of it. And so... I just started praying in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit. Holy Spirit, I'm believing for the manifestation from my back. Well, 
I started waking up early in the morning to pray and spend time with the Holy Spirit. And so I did early one morning, about 4.30, 5 o'clock. I was up praying in the Spirit, hour, hour and a half. And I heard a voice that say, turn on this particular gospel program. I turned him on. And the guy said, he was talking to his congregation. It was filmed. He's talking to his congregation. And he said, if you have back problems here in the sanctuary, stand up. I want to pray for you. And he looked at the camera and he says, if you're watching me, stand up. So I stood up. I mean, my mama didn't raise no fool. I stood up. And I think he said, lift your hands. I lifted my hands. He prayed. I didn't feel a thing. Not that you need to feel something. I didn't feel the thing. I sat down. I was totally healed in my back. <laughs> totally healed. And one last one. I'm just trying to teach you tonight. I'm trying to help you. I just want to help you tonight. One last one. When I was 14 years of age, I started wearing glasses. So for all these years, I've either been wearing glasses or contacts. So I've been believing God for years to heal my eyes. Nothing's ever happened. And so I started praying in the Spirit about my eyes. Started believing God, Holy Spirit, I believe you're bringing the manifestation of healing to my eyes. And so I go to Friday Night Light football games. Permian, Odessa Permian. I go to the football games. I had to wear my glasses. And all of a sudden, uh, it would be the fall of 16, I noticed I was getting a little blurry through my glasses. I thought, well, maybe I need a new prescription. I took them off, and I noticed I was starting to see everything a little more clear. Well, you know, if you drive a car, which I do, and you have a driver's license, then if you wear glasses, you have, they put that on your license as a restriction. I've always wanted that off my driver's license. I want zero restrictions off my driver's license. You say, why? I just do. <laughs> And so, I know the girl at the DMV, and so I went last August on my birthday. August 10th is my birthday. Just, okay. It's like a national holiday in my church. Okay. Yes. August 10th. You need my address? My website? Do you need that? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just having fun with you. And so I went, believing God that I was going to pass that test. And so we went through all the rigmarole you got to do to renew your license. And then the last thing they did was give me the eye test. And so she, she pointed to one particular line and one particular series of, uh, I think there were letters. They were blurry to me. I couldn't read them. So she said, go to the top, read. Go to the side, read. I could read everything. But somehow, she, I guess they have it fixed. You need to read this one thing. She pointed me back to it. I couldn't read it. She said, well, do this, do that. Took me back the third time. So I got quiet. I got quiet. And in my spirit, I said, Holy Spirit, I have believed you. I have prayed in the spirit. I know I'm getting better. This thing is blurry to me. I'm believing for a breakthrough. So I opened up my eyes. God is my witness. I saw it perfectly. I saw it perfectly, and I... And I told her what the letters were, and both of them clapped for me. <laughs> I have zero restrictions on my driver's license. I do not wear contacts. I don't wear glasses. After all these years, why? Because the Holy Spirit builds up the temple, repairs the temple. I'm telling you, he's your friend. And I'll close, I'm a little late. Let me, let me close with this verse. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says to us, Paul said, Now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus, may the love of the Father, and may the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The word communion there is the Greek word koinonia. You've all heard that word. He longs for your communion. He longs for your fellowship. And I've always prayed in the Spirit, but not like I have the last several years. It's become the driving force of my life. I can't wait every morning to get up and spend time with the Holy Spirit. 
to let, see, when I got into the ministry, I got so busy, I just trained myself to pray all day long. And that's good. But there's just something about that intense time, spending time with the Holy Spirit, communing with Him, fellowship with Him. I'm telling you, my life is better today. My church is better. Everything's better. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has come alongside you to make everything better in your life. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of the Father, and may the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I love you with all my heart. God bless you.